We have uh, Professor Arthur C. Clarke visiting India again. Now, Arthur C. Clarke to most people is not known as Professor Arthur C. Clarke because they have read so many of his books. He is truly a remarkable person and I, I have a great, the greatest difficulty in categorizing him. Is he a writer? Is he a futurologist only? Is he a technologist? Is he a scientist? He defies all description. He goes under the ocean. He, he does all kinds of crazy things. But uh, by all accounts, he's a very remarkable man. Born in England, he lives in Sri Lanka. He produces movies, he produces TV series. There are centers known after him. There are some people who insist that the synchronous orbit in which the INSAT goes around the Earth, for example, at 36,000 kilometers, that it should be called Clark orbit. And many people do call it Clark orbit because years ago, he prophesied that such an orbit could be used for, uh, for communication very effectively, worldwide communication. So he's a difficult man to describe, but a very, very remarkable man, remarkable man of uh, this half century. And so we're very happy he's here once again. He has been coming to us very often, good friend of many people in this country, and very much involved in some of our programs. This time he's here to give the Nehru Memorial Lecture and so I probably shouldn't say what he's going to say in that lecture, though I know a little bit, and this would be known to people. But uh, there is another aspect of his personality, and I think we'll explore some of these things in conversation with you, Arthur, today. Now uh, tell me, what are your current real enthusiasms? Well, <coughs> My current real enthusiasm, believe it or not, is a small puppy that I just acquired <laughs> from Rhodesian Ridgeback about this big, which um, I've always had dogs. I had a series of German Shepherds, and the last one f died a month ago, and now I've switched to Rhodesian Ridgebacks. So that is my current enthusiasm. And the two little girls, who were my partner's uh, children in Colombo, and I, that's one reason why I'm not going to leave Colombo anymore, because everything I love is there. <laughs> <laughs> Puppy and the little girls. But you and my serious, but my uh, intellectual enthusiasm. Well, I'm involved in quite a few books still, and a couple of movies, and um, I've got a magnificent new telescope, a 14-inch Celestron, which I hope to install on the roof. And uh, well, I have plenty to keep me busy. Tell me, over the years that you've been writing science fiction, and you've been doing other things in between, has your concept of fiction, a science fiction, changed? Yes, very much so. In the early days when I started writing, which is now 50 years ago, yes. uh, the emphasis was on the gee whiz technology, yes. you know, the uh, scientific gimmick, and very little consideration of human factors. And, uh, in fact, many of the stories at the time were just transplanted Westerns, you know, another Martian bit the dust yes, kind of yes. thing. Um, but now, of course, uh, science fiction has become a very respected genre, and many uh, distinguished writers of what is called mainstream literature are getting interested in. Of course, Many great writers wrote science fiction. Kipling That's wrote right. some excellent science fiction, but H.G. Wells is perhaps the, is yes. the best known protagonist, yes. and he wrote you know, classic works of non-science fiction. In my own case, I have graduated more and more to uh, the human side of things, and my, the novel I've been working on for 20 years, The Songs of Distant Earth, which I regard as my magnum opus, it's almost entirely concerned with human relationships rather than uh, technology, even though there is a great deal of technology in the world. You know, you are also a great enthusiast about what some of the new technologies can do for people. 
and sometimes people think that you you tend to give too much credit to technology. You think that uh, there is some kind of inevitability as to how people will be because of technology. Now, though these are those people yeah. who don't know the other side and that you keep on worrying about the other side. Fortunately, as technology becomes cheaper and cheaper and simpler, we've seen this happening with personal computers. Yes. They're spreading all over the world. They're very expensive. In fact, no one could possibly afford them. Now they're becoming so cheap that very soon almost anybody or any school will have some kind of personal computer. Video equipment, I mean, uh, <laughs> we have a room full of it. But you can get away with a small camera. Yes. Uh, so more and more technology, as technology spreads, people will adapt to their own needs and their own, you know, their own environment. I, 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 I think that's just how it should go, except somehow technology is presented as such a with so much awe around it that uh, people have not realized that the present day technology has a flexibility which that it can be put together in many different ways. And this is doesn't usually come out of the writings and sayings of many enthusiasts, not even in this country. And this is one of the things which I keep on arguing. Uh, and uh, we have discussed mm -hmm. it on several occasions. Remember about yes. satellites? Uh, right. Uh, Andy Clark of it. <laughs> Andy Clark of it. And Andy Clark of it. <laughs> the children are now taking for granted these electronic toys, and that is yes. demystifying the, yeah. the computers and things, which uh, to the older generation, are, you know, they're terrified that that keyboard, you know, it scares them, but the children will take it completely for granted. The three year old in my house is playing with my computer. But do you think. Uh, is, is changing topic a wee bit, but connected with this. When you say taken for granted, mm. we take our automobiles for granted, our computers for granted, our TV sets. And, and uh, many people say, well, see, the society is becoming scientific and technological. But clearly that's not so. We're just using these things. Mm. When you take them for granted, in some sense you may even get away from a situation where you would have a chance of creating things yourself, understanding. Well, <clears throat> the technology should be transparent, to use a phrase which That's is getting more popular. So you don't know it is there. And um, th this is uh, certainly true with word processors. I mean, I've made this great switch myself from typewriters to, to word processors, and I can't imagine ever using a typewriter again. Just as anyone who used a typewriter could never imagine going back to pen and ink. I would rather go back to pen and ink yes, than go back to a typewriter after using a word processor. And a good word processing system should be transparent. You're not aware of all the things that are going on in the computer yes. as you move paragraphs around and check your spelling. It should be a tool which is invisible. Wouldn't it be wonderful if the tremendous energies, creative energies and drive which major countries have mm -hmm. could be put together for cooperative programs, for example, exploring the planetary mm -hmm. system or going to Mars or uh, exploiting the resources of the moon or all kinds mm -hmm. of uh, large cities. Do you think this is, this is uh, a possible way out and uh, doesn't it look like a gimmick? Well, I think it's uh, not only possible, but it's inevitable if we are to survive. And there now is a movement in this direction. I'm very happy for you, know, and particularly happy that the Americans and the Russians are quietly getting together in space in many ways that the public doesn't know about. And uh, the serious talk of a joint Mars expedition, perhaps in the early next century. There's much more cooperation in space technology, space science, uh, than one uh, would imagine from reading the newspaper yes. headlines. Yeah. Do you think of it some kind of sublimation of, uh, of uh, unspent energy? You think well, uh, ag uh, of right. aggressive. Uh, okay, the moral, the moral equivalent of war. And we have the spatial equivalent of war. <laughs> but why? I mean, we are aggressive animals. We need some outlet. Are we? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you should see a football, <laughs> a British football match. <laughs> Is that inevitable? Uh, because uh, one keeps wondering that. Uh, here are these tremendous energies. How come humanity can't use these energies on a whole lot of agendas here on the ground? I mean, I mean look well, at the state of okay. the world. Yes, but when I said aggressive, there's nothing wrong with aggression as long as it's directed against nature. 
and then, then of course it shouldn't be overdone because we have to cooperate with That's nature. That's terrible. We should not be aggressive. It, I guess nature. it depends on one's on the definition of the word aggression. Um, I don't mean enmity, hostility, but some kind of um, let's say development or even exploitation, or that is perhaps perhaps a, as unfortunate. Concept. Yes. Exploration, okay? Discovery, yes. exploration. Those are sublimations of aggression, if you like. Would we explore, or would we have scientific research if we were not perhaps basically hunting animals? Is that all part of our human nature? And that is a, a positive application of those dark instincts. After you were a radar officer or something like that during the war, weren't you? That's right, yes. And it is at that time you, you thought of this uh, possibility of worldwide communication. Was it or was it later? No, it was during the war. But as the war was coming to an end, in 1944, um, I was working on a very advanced microwave radar, ground control approach, yes. the talk down system. At the same time, I was in discussions with my colleagues in the British Interplanetary Society, ah, yes. the post-war, the pre-war space cadets, saying, how can we get people interested in space travel? So I said, well, what can rockets, what can space technology do to, to make money, to pay for our dream of going to the moon and planets? And it was the combination of working on radar, communication technology, and thinking about satellites and rockets that melded together and gave me the concept of using satellites for radio and TV broadcasting. I was quite certain that it would uh, come about. In fact, my original title for the essay was The Future of World Communications, yes. which of course um, <laughs> uh, didn't tell you what it was about, and the editor chose a title, Extraterrestrial Relays, which of course was a perfectly accurate descriptive title, but my original title was The Future of World Communications. I was sure that that was the answer. But I did not imagine it would be it would come so quickly. I yes. refer to maybe to the, to the end of the century. You know. Did it strike to you as something rather nice and remarkable while doing this paper, or you you sort of said, "Oh, it's, it's well." The idea of a stationary orbit goes back to, uh, to the twenties. I mean, yes. in fact, I don't know who first said in print that an orbit such an orbit was possible. It could have anybody from the time of Newton onwards could very be perfectly, perfectly obvious. Perfectly obvious. Uh, and the early space pioneers in the 1920s had discussed the use of that orbit for putting uh, space stations. Yeah. So one thing I did miss, mm -hmm. it's rather interesting, I didn't mention the time lag, and the, uh, you know, it takes a fraction of a second to get yes, back. So when you're like talking to anybody yes. uh, over the tower, a telephone link, uh, if you talk fast and interrupt each other, you can get in real trouble. Now, the reason why I knew, of course, it would take time to get there and back, but I didn't bother to calculate it. And the reason why is I was much more interested in the television broadcasting aspect, yes. where it doesn't matter about that. That's right, that's right. Yeah, but you see, it's remarkable how people have got used to this time. Exactly. I mean, at one time, in fact, uh, my friend John Pierce at the Bell Labs, they were quite sure that they would have to use low altitude satellites moving around for us, simply because of the time lag. Now, the, the long term answer, of course, the long term answer, is the low altitude synchronous, the low altitude stationary satellite, which stays hovering over the same uh, spot on the Earth, only a few a thousand kilometers. That is quite a technological yes, problem, as you know. Your, your space elevator. The space elevator. Right? Yes, yes. Could you tell a little bit about this? I, mean, yes, I well, think it's the best to hear. Uh, you have written about it even in. Uh, in your fiction, I think you have uh, written otherwise and thought yes, about it. Yes, in fact, this. I have a, a, a technical article in my yes. essays, Ascent to Orbit, yes. the space elevator. It's only an intellectual concept at the moment. The idea is quite simple, even though it may be rather fantastic. Let's suppose this is the, this is the, the Earth, and here we do have the stationary satellite moving at the same speed, 36,000 kilometers up, so it stays at the same spot over the equator as the Earth turns. Well, in principle, you could lay a cable yes. from the equator out to the satellite, and then you would have a means of sending up payloads by an elevator by purely electric energy. And it costs only about a dollar a pound, or that's 50 cents a kilogram, mm -hmm. something of that order, to send payloads into space in terms of energy. Instead of thousands of dollars a kilogram, it, it takes by rocket power. Because you throw so much. Because uh, you, throw, you waste so much of the rocket fuel just lifting other rocket fuel. Yes. You're fighting an exponential law all the time. 
So the idea of the space elevator, which was first conceived by Russian engineer Yuri right. Aksutanov in yes. Leningrad, um, it's a wonderful dream. The great problem is, is there any material strong enough to hang them. down from 36,000 kilometers? That's right. The longest, if you make a thread of ordinary materials, even strong as steel, you can only hang vertically for a few scores of kilometers where it snaps under its own weight. But theoretically, there can be. Now, there are materials yeah. like uh, Kevlar. Yeah. Um, I always say trademark. Uh, <laughs> they can hang uh, several hundred kilometers under its own weight for its snaps. That's a, a uniform cable. Now, then, if you taper the cables, uh, then there's no limit. And in theory, you can make such a cable to come from synchronous orbit or stationary all the way down to the Earth. You could use the space elevator for two purposes. One is to get from the Earth's surface up to the uh, synchronous orbit. And then if, if, as it would in fact have to do, the systems extended beyond, you could go out there and it'd be like a sling. And if you let go at the end, you'd be slung off yeah. in any direction you want. You could go sail onto the planets. I always thought it's a, I mean, it is not an impossible idea, but this kind of, these kinds of examples to be worked at in detail would be a very nice way of uh, learning dynamics and science and strengths of materials at the theoretical limit. And uh, uh, we don't uh, normally pursue these well enough in our educational programs. You know, people right. say neutron star as a laboratory for studying uh, mechanics. Yes. I mean, it's much more exciting than sort of masses sliding down inclined Inclined planes. planes. I mean, it's dynamic and... I don't know how many people have given up physics. Because of dull dull examples. Yes. Uh, Arthur, I have read some of your fiction coming back to this, and also we have talked about many things, about what's happening in the world, what's the future, who are the actors. And uh, I have noticed that you have a capability of being involved and yet detached. And uh, detached in a way that in your world there are no really wicked people or wicked societies or wicked countries, really wicked. Uh, Would you respond to this? Is this true? It's it's a very good point. I don't think I've ever had any villains in any of my stories. I've had people whose actions were deplorable, but usually (coughs) Uh, and they thought they were doing something uh, not necessarily bad. And um, this is true. The, the human nature is not black and white. Yes. And uh, na- even nations, although there can be sort of crazy administrations and crazy governments, as we see often, too often nowadays, um, I try to avoid um, painting people as villainous because I'm just as I avoid disastrous and catastrophic futures because I think that one's in danger of creating a you know, self-fulfilling prophecy if one does too much of this kind of thing. Even if I you try to be an optimist. Yeah. Well, Arthur, we will continue this another time. It's been marvelous having you here and uh, I hope you will come again and again because uh, we'd like to continue this conversation. I know I'll have several occasions to, to meet. But uh, this small exploration of this remarkable human being, very unusual. You couldn't really think that uh, such people could be designed by, by anybody. And it's a privilege to have him around and to have him stirring up things and giving joy and pleasure to lots of people. Thank you. Thank you very much.